welcome back to yet another week of Behind the Lens. Already here, it is Eclipse Day in the, in North America today, across the United States. Uh, we saw a little bit of the eclipse. I was driving through it on my way into the station this morning. But, uh, and I've already seen some postings from friends of mine who were in the, uh, the totality zone. So I can't wait to see more later today. Um, but a very auspicious day. Who knows what happens on, on days with full eclipses. We can go back through history and time, and there's a lot of shaky things that may have to do with uh, that a lot of uh, religions and pagans and civilizations attributed to days with eclipses. So we'll see what pans out uh, today uh, here on Behind the Lens and for all of you listening. And welcome. My name is Debbie Elias. I am film critic, creator, and host of Behind the Lens. You can find my movie reviews and interviews in the U.S. and abroad, in print and online, in a myriad of publications. But every Monday, you can find me right here on Adrenaline Radio, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, where we go behind the lens and below the line and everything in between. And everything in between is kind of what we're doing. We're going to be talking about today with two very special guests. Uh, very hot button topics have been building and building. Diversity issues have been building and building in the film and television communities. So often we hear we've had outcries from the disabled communities when able bodied actors are playing disabled parts. Why are you not hiring, you know, perfectly capable? you know, disab uh, from the disabled community rather than have an able-bodied actor play a part. Similarly, why are you not writing for certain ethnicities? But what is really emerging at the forefront, thanks in large part to transparency, is the issue of transgender. And transgender really came into the forefront uh, with Bruce Jenner's transition into becoming Caitlyn Jenner. But while that may be notable... I have to say that we've got some filmmakers who are joining us today that are really putting the issue of transgender playing transgender, transition playing transition on the map. Uh, Amy Fox, writer, producer, actress, and showrunner of The Switch is going to be joining us shortly. Uh, this is one of the funniest shows I have seen. It has been available in Canada. It is just now available here in the United States on Vimeo On Demand, Amazon, and one other platform, I believe, and possibly iTunes as well. It is hilarious. We're going to talk to Amy about developing this show, the casting of it, and everything that goes into it. Then at 1130, I'm so thrilled. This actress hit my radar before L.A. Film Festival with her feature film debut in And Then There Was Eve. The film went on to win the L.A. Muse Fiction Award at L.A. Film Festival, thanks in large part to the performance by Rachel Crow. Rachel has done everything from off-Broadway, and I got to talk to her about playing Dracula at the Pendragon Theater in New York. Uh, she's played Henry V. She's played Algernon and Flowers for Algernon. She is a musician. She is a photographer. She is currently working on a photo essay on the gut laugh, um, which I'm curious to hear her thoughts on the loss this weekend of one of the greatest comedians to ever produce gut laughs, Jerry Lewis. Um, but Rachel's joining us at the half hour mark. So I am sure we're going to have, and she is truly, she's fabulous, absolutely fabulous. Every film festival, and you've heard me say this over the years, there are always, there's always one group of filmmakers or particular actors that stand out for me that I then end up following through their careers because they, there's just something special. Rachel has that something special. She is she is the actress to come out of L.A. Film Festival for me this year. So I can't wait to hear about what she's working on next because I know she's been working uh, and get her input on transgender casting, writing and programming that's out there today. But before the ladies join us today, 
a film that opened. It's been out on direct TV for the past month. It just opened in limit in limited release in theatrical, and is also available on all of your your Spectrum on Demand VOD platforms. Shot caller. Uh, I am beyond privileged to know the filmmaker Rick Roman Waugh. I've known Rick I've, and his brother Scott for over 35 years now, and to see where bo- what both of them have done, where they come from out of the stunt world and into the directing world, making names for themselves with these inc- incredibly high-profile films in some cases, um, it is outstanding, and Rick has outdone himself with Shot Caller. Oh, my! But I think I think we're gonna put uh, I think we're gonna hold off on an excl- on a clip with Rick because we've already got Amy call Amy Fox calling in. So why don't we just we'll hold off on Rick Wall until the end of the show, and we're gonna talk to Amy Fox right now. This is the beauty of live radio, people. And yesterday was National Radio Day. Amy Fox, what a pleasure to have you. Welcome, welcome to Behind the Lens. Oh, pleasure to be here. Oh, my God. And look at that, so prompt, and Sylvia is going to be so happy. She loves it when her clients are always prompt, on time, and ready. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I've got to tell you, Amy, what hilarity with the switch. Glad you like it. Absolute hilarity. Um, this is the most interesting cast of characters, literally and figuratively, that I have seen come along in a long time. You have touched <laughs> on something that everybody can relate to. Everybody has oh, land. Thanks. Everyone has landlord issues. Everybody has that one friend who is an activist, maybe not an eco-terrorist, but an activist. You know, we all know troubled teens. We, uh, you know, it's we all know people that are going through something emotional, something physical. Everybody has dating issues. You have touched on a show here, an idea here that everybody can relate to and everybody can laugh with and commiserate with at the same time. Oh, good. Well, our idea was to make something funny that everyone can relate to. So that, I'm, I'm glad that's carrying on. Where did the idea for the switch come from? What was the, what was the genesis of this one? Uh, well, I was uh, part of a comedy team, and people absolutely adored watching it, and we just delivered it at this happy transgender event. And then we went, oh, well, how do we get this out to people? Oh, well, we could tour all the transgender comedy clubs around the United States, but those don't really exist. So we thought about, oh, hey, you know, what people are making is a web series. That can't be that hard. And we've never, you know, directed or shot or acted or written any screenplays before. So uh, uh, seven years later, after a web version and a TV pilot, we now have a TV show. Um, and uh, along the way, we wanted to make sure that as many people could enjoy it as possible, the trans or not. So we made sure to make it accessible and relatable and ridiculous. Uh, but it's ridiculously fun. And there is so much warmth within the characters and within the storylines. You know, and transgender, as I said at the top of the show, this has become, it's a very hot-button topic right now. It really started a few years ago with transparency when it hit the air. But <clears throat> more finally, you know, Hollywood in television film is starting to wake up and actually start casting the, the right people for the right roles, and that includes the transgender community. I like to think so, yeah. You know, how, you uh, know, I, was this part of your impetus in creating the switch? Is Was the shortage, the lack of product, you yeah, know, that um, accurately portrays some of life's, you know, the foibles and the hardships that not just the trans community can relate to, but everybody can relate to, which that's what I love because you humanize everything and any stigmas that people may have, you break them down. Um, well, what we wanted to do was hmm, um, not just change who was in the content, but what the content was in the first place. 
a lot of these, we're still seeing Oscar bait movies where they can't seem to find one trans person, even though our tiny show <laughs> finds five lead actors. Um, and we didn't want to do like another biopic or another tragedy or just another coming out story. So we wanted to like really show the breadth of human experience um, in which we're following a bunch of people who happen to be trans, which informs the plot of the sitcom in ways that people have never really seen before. So we, you know, we had a sitcom like Seinfeld, where the characters don't really have any real problems. They have to kind of imagine them. Um, and what we're doing is we're creating real, taking real problems that people have and going like, oh, hey, you know what, this is excellent sitcom fodder. Um, and uh, I'm seeing more and more of that approach to diversity in, the, in a lot of comedy overall. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still, you know, slow going, but uh, I'm glad that we can be a part of it. Well, you know, talk to me about your characters. I mean, I have to say your lead actress, <laughs> Nyla Rose, who plays Sue, Oh, my. We all know a Sue. Some of us have been Sue. Uh, you know, gets fired, has no money, thought she had money, but realized she's not that good at handling money. You know, has this whole new life crashing on her ex's couch and, you know, starts dating a bank manager. <laughs> I it's it's Sue is such. A fabulous a Sue kind of reminds me of a George Costanza. Since you mentioned Seinfeld, Sue reminds me a little of a George Costanza. Good. Um, well, yeah, Nyla, the actress who plays Sue, is actually a professional wrestler. Um, and uh, we did this search as far and wide as we could to find the best, funniest trans people. We had like a hundred and something people apply for for Sue, we've got 71 or something auditions, Nyla is the funniest, and she really brings the, um, the every woman optimism at the same time knowing that the world is not, does not share her optimism back at her. Mm-hmm. And I think that really says something about, I think generationally, um, what people are looking at from a, a system that we know is not quite doing what it should. Yeah, I'm, and something else about Sue with Nyla playing Sue is that she is also a big and beautiful woman. Some, oh, yeah. S- uh, something else we don't see often enough in television and film. Yeah, well, this is uh, what happens when you cast people based on their ability to act. Rather than <laughs> arbitrary standards of what a protagonist is quote supposed unquote to look like, mm-hmm. um, you wind up getting not only excellent performances but a you know realistic range of human body types. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and you know, with your ensemble cast playing along with Nyla, you know, you've got Lindsay Corn who or Corin, I'm not sure how you pronounce Lindsay's last name, um, who plays Antonia. Your character's landlord, Vincent mm-hmm. um, Viezer as Zoe, our troubled teen who lives next door, and Andrea Maynard who plays Sandra, the homicide detective, also next door neighbor. I, I really I want to live in this apartment building. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. How did you? Oh, what led you to each of the the personality types for each of your characters? You know, having a political activist eco-terrorist living next door really is not, you know, that's that's not in the top five things you think your neighbor does. Uh, so. uh, well, part of that is we were basing the characters on ourselves, and Chris was based on me, especially when we came up with the show. Um, uh, one of my friends commented when they came over to my house, this is not a house, this is an encampment. And as far as, like, living next to someone who's doing some pretty uh, direct <laughs> forms of activism goes, it, it has to do with the, the setting of the show, is uh, trans people coming out are often looking for somewhere safe, and often the safest places are people where, or have people who are pushing the, the bounds of social norms mm-hmm. in one way or another. Um, in Chris's case, they are doing something incredibly illegal in order to reduce carbon emissions. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I have to admit, I do like the crossbow. <laughs> Chris and a crossbow just, you know, 
You just look so at ease holding that crossbow. <laughs> well, I actually trained with that thing. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my. My. Is that, is that why we have such great comfort and ease in the way you hold that? I had to say that was a better crossbow hold than, than I ever saw with Buffy. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> But, you know, and then moving through the group, you've got, in creating, you know, your, the landlord, Antonia. You know, mm-hmm. very interesting character. Sure. Yeah, well, uh, Antonia is a character who is not entirely at ease with themselves, but is trying to project an aura of confident, cool power um, when they actually have things that are going on on the inside that are, are not at ease at all. Mm-hmm. And Part of the show is that as people are coming to realize more about themselves, it's often a real shock. Like, it's, uh, self-discovery sounds wonderful, but it's actually a lot of scary change. Mm-hmm. Um, whether that's someone who's trans or someone who's just getting in, used to having friends for the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, especially when that person is a career criminal who <laughs> will stab you. <laughs> Well, you know, and hand in hand with your career criminal is Zoe. And I have to say, Vincent's performance as Zoe just blows my mind. That Oh yeah, Vincent is phenomenal. Oh. Um, the director said to him, um, okay, just feel like you're on lots and lots of coffee all the time. <laughs> and Vincent just took that and ran with it. Um, we also, in episode two, get to meet uh, Phil, who's uh, a series regular, played by Chance Kingsmith, who's involved, uh, been involved with the project for years, um, who is uh, a trans man who is trying really hard to fit into, like, affluent gay men's culture mm-hmm. um, and copying a fake British accent and <laughs> taking out the hostility that he experiences from the world and everybody else around him and trying to develop good frenemyship. Mm-hmm. I'm not really sure what you want to call it. I like that. Frenemyships. Um, that, that's a new one. I yeah. like that. I'm going to steal that and use it sometime. That, that's a good one. Well, you know, something you do with the character of Zoe, you also introduce the idea of bullying at school. Mm-hmm. And that is still so key in our society today. Yeah, see, it's, I mean, the deeper you dig into this show, Amy, the more that you really have touched on so many social issues here. And the fact that you've got bully, you're, you, not just bullying in the workplace and discrimination in the workplace, but you carry this down to bullying at school. Uh, you know, and I think that's so important because you're also hitting a, a younger demographic you know, with your messaging here in the show. Is that, is yeah. that, has that, was that your intent? Oh, as you develop the storylines and you develop the characters, it, there appears to be a progression where you are digging deeper and deeper with each episode. Um, there was a, a show on the air in the 2000s called Firefly, which was a science fiction show that got canceled in the first season. Nathan, and apparently the writers Nathan were like, Fillion. If like it canceled at any time, make it count. Um, and we knew going into this, okay, first season is six episodes. Got to make them count. If there's anything important you want to do, get it in there. We're not going to hold back on anything. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not going to get people to wait for a special episode. Like, every episode is going to be good. Um, and also part of that is our, our social mandate is thinking about, okay, what, what's really important? What's topical? What can people relate to? It's all got to go in there. So we see school, we see trans people in sports, trans people in women's spaces, trans people in dating, and then dealing with the medical system mm-hmm. um, while also hallucinating that one might be a starship captain and um, assassinating oil lobbyists to save on carbon emissions. Well, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned sports. Um... Where did Doomball come from? I got to ask about Doomball. Uh, it's a cross between roller derby and Calvin Ball. Uh, Calvin Ball, the sport popularized by Calvin Hobbes, um, whose rules change as you play it. And then uh, roller derby is a very popular sport in a lot of like 
LGBT spaces that's also just incredibly dangerous. Uh, d- trust me, I grew up in I grew up in Philadelphia at the height of when roller derby was like one of the big sports back in the in the late fifties, early sixties. And oh, yeah. and it's like, oh my god, I would be glued to the television to the UHF channels watching the Philadelphia Warriors skate every single week. And I just that that, that I'm mean, I love the fact that it was so violent and dangerous and. Trust me, I tried some of those maneuvers on my brothers in the living room. I, they, I was not always successful. But uh, roller derby is just, it is so much fun. Now when you cross it, as you're describing the elements of doom ball, so all rules go out the window. Um, this Doom ball could be its own show. You do oh, realize, yeah. you could create doom ball as its own show. Um, we also had help from Falling Leaf Stunts. Uh, Lee Havdale and Kim Cheong to just pack that episode with all kinds of weird stunts. Um, <laughs> not to mention we've got like pogo sticks and wiffle bats and the paintball gun and all kinds of wonderful strangeness. Not to mention Nyla bringing her pro wrestling experience so that she can get hit in the back of the head and do a full somersault. Oh my god. Explant. Now with that kind of antics going on in a show, does it help you that this is a web series and you're not controlled by any networks or anybody putting the kibosh on something because of insurance, because it's too dangerous, you know, blah, 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 all the excuses known to mankind. Uh, well, actually, it's a television show here in Canada. We're just distributing it through iTunes. Mm-hmm. Um, but our broadcaster out television was very gentle with any kind of control. They just wanted to make sure it was funny. Um, and um, that gave us a certain independence that another show that was, say, bound to the will of advertisers might not enjoy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm yeah. curious. Um, you've got your six episodes of season one. What's happening with season two? Oh, uh, well, uh, we are taking this directly to Amazon and iTunes and on September 1st, Google Play in the United States and um, in other countries. And if we can manage to get 100,000 people to get a copy of Season 1, that gives us what we need to make Season 2. Um, one of the wonderful things about not having advertisers, middlemen, or a network is that while your average TV show would be considered to be like a failure if they can't get two million people to watch an episode when it airs. If we can get 100,000 people, we're good to go. Wow. Wow. That's not very many when you think about it in the grand scheme of things. Uh, no. No, it's really not. Oh. Um, uh, because, I mean, I'm also, I mean, I think you should definitely have a season two. I mean, this, cool. this is, I mean, it's, so funny but it is it just it hits you in the heart because you do relate to these to these issues to these personal quandaries that everybody goes through and the things that they face you know that this is something that a lot of people need and as you mentioned you know it's kind of like a Seinfeld it very much is it's a 21st century Seinfeld yeah yeah how involved uh, as a producer how and showrunner how involved are you in your production design I've got to ask you about that because I just think your production design is so much fun. It is eye-popping. It is colorful. It is kaleidoscopic. But everything, the lines are clean. The colors are clean. You know, there's a there's so much going on that there's always something I, something for your eye. Um, Jim Garrard came on and wanted to make sure that the show's color palette and design and how the camera moves through the show really reflected the content, which was poppy and video game-ish and often cartoonish and really got together with the art team and made this thing that looked very, very sharp. Mm -hmm. And um, one of our inspirations outside of, say, video games and cartoons, at least here, was also looking at anime from the 80s and 90s, um, where there were a lot of really gender-bending television shows that came out in Japan that people here just didn't watch. Mm-hmm. And we're like, oh my goodness, this is this would be an amazing uh, thing to 
see on television in North America. Uh, so there's a, a design influence from there, too. Um, although I, the, the series that kept coming up when we were talking about production design was definitely Kimmy Schmidt. Yeah. <laughs> um, looking at the colors in that. Yeah. Can oh. work. So now this, I mean, this really, because, I mean, you've been acting, you've been writing, you, you're just, you are just a force of nature with all the things that you do. Um, what did you learn about yourself in bringing the switch to life and getting this made? And, you know, now going beyond Canada, going into the United States, being on all these platforms, what have you learned in this journey so far? Uh, how much work I can do in a day, um, <laughs> which is a lot, it turns out. Um, I've learned about having a wonderful team that supports me. Um, my producer, Ingo, uh, was absolutely brilliant at figuring how we could stretch our budget as far as possible. Uh, working with Ren Hansen, our lead writer, and Siobhan Singh, who's also on the writer team, got me to work in a team there. It, it really taught me about relying on community, whether that was for, like, production duties, um, care, like, it was people showing up to set and helping with the lighting or helping us find some food or what have you and to feed the cast and the crew. And I realized just how much it, it, it's good to be a part of a team and part of a community, a, a lot like you see on the show, actually. Mm -hmm. um, what that means and, and how there's this real hunger for group projects that give us meaning and a sense of hope. Mm -hmm. um, and how nice it is to, well, have a bit of a leadership role in that. And so where where how hard where do you see yourself taking? Where do you see yourself and the team taking the switch? Oh well, uh, we're planning to pop it up in more and more international venues. Maybe pop some subtitling on it, and then um, once we have a hundred thousand people, we are going to make a second season, and in the second season we can find out about the uh, the hunt for Chris, with Chris's assassination of oil lobbyists. We can see <laughs> Zoe continue on to try and develop into a normal person, and completely not develop into a normal person. Uh, Sue's attempt to immigrate to Canada, and what like the immigration system is like. We can see Antonia really come into their own as a human being, um, and realize that they don't understand how to relate to people, um, still realizing how to relate to people, and um, just the, the entire community continue to come together into a wonderful dysfunctional whole. Well, Amy, I mean, you've got me hooked on this show, let me tell you. Um, and I can't recommend it highly enough to everybody. I want to see you hit that 100,000 so that you can move on to your season two, because this really is... It is wonderful entertainment, but you have a lot of great moral values and an integrity going on in here. And I, I just, you know, you've done a great job. Thanks. It's, uh, it's a team effort. Well, thank you so much for joining me on Behind the Lens today, Amy. Hey, it's a pleasure. This is, and I hope you'll come back on the show again. I, I hope so. We have many other wonderful projects and hopefully a season two. Well, I would love to talk to you about your other projects, too. So please, yes, oh. we will set something uh, up. Quickly, if I may, we also have a gender-inclusive children's coloring book called uh, Finding Gender, which will be coming out shortly. And we're working on an optimistic space-faring science fiction series called Synthesis. Wow. Okay, you're busier than I even thought you were. Okay, and where will people be able to get the, the children's coloring book? Uh, I think that will be coming out on Amazon soon. Um, it hasn't entirely got to the point where we've sorted out distribution. We've just uh, approved it and printed up some test copies. Okay. And like those, so. So maybe it'll be out there in time for everybody's Christmas stockings. Oh, I think that's a real possibility, yes. Oh, well, again, Amy, thank you so much, and yes, I'm going to get you back on here to talk more about all these wonderful things you're doing. Looking forward to it, and a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much, Amy. Bye-bye. you. Bye. And that was Amy Fox talking about The Switch, which you can find on all your platforms now. It is hilarious, people. Absolutely hilarious and so well-written.
Characters so well crafted. And now, talk about fabulous. Talking about fabulous, I have the fabulous Rachel Crow on the line with me. Hello, Rachel. Uh, hello. How are you? I am fine. How are you? I am very good. I am. I just watched I'm, the eclipse. Yes. How for did, what it was worth? Oh, for what it wasn't that great. Uh, here in the valley, it wasn't that great. No. Oh uh, well, I was in the car driving to Whittier, and so I only caught glimpses, and it didn't look that spectacular here either. <laughs> no, I think we were too far away. We missed the to- the path of totality. You know, isn't that a great, great phrase? The, the path of totality. Well, yeah, and I always think of, because in law, there's always an argument you make called the totality of the circumstances. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, so, you know, when I hear when I started hearing all the news broadcasters doing path of totality, I thought that was quite entertaining. <laughs> Sounds like something from philosophy. It does, and I guarantee you, or most, Eastern religion. Well, I guarantee you, most of the, most of the broadcasters I've been hearing use it have not taken philosophy classes. So, oh, shocker! <laughs> <laughs> One thing that's not a shocker is we get to talk about you, and then there was Eve and all your fun projects. Yay! I'm still so thrilled that, and then there was Eve. One. The award for the LA Muse, the LA Muse Fiction Award at LA Film Festival, and I know it was uh, it was a mind-boggling event. You know, I mean, how did you? And it's, and I guarantee you, one of the biggest draws and one of the biggest factors was your performance in the film. Oh, thank you. I mean, you know how much I love your performance in the film. And, yes, I do. I do. And as I told you on the opening night festival red carpet, it's like I had no idea that you had ever transitioned. Your perf- yeah, that amazes me. <laughs> your perf- I'm looking at this film and just blown away by your performance. I had no clue. No clue. Well, that's good. I. I think I think the filmmakers would be pleased to know that. Um, yeah, I think I said I think I told Savannah that. Um, I think you did, yeah. But that to me, and to me that is a testament to your skill. It was having been retired for twelve years and away from acting. Um, it was both simultaneously terrifying, and also I kept having these moments where I was like. I think I got better by not doing it. It's very if that possible. that makes any sense at all. Well, yeah, it's like when you lay something down, you get stuck. Because here you are, you're working on your, your photographic essay book. You're working on music. You've got an album coming out. You're constantly doing stuff. You must go through right. that with your projects and you lay them down and you come back to them later. I very much do. I very much do. I will get something 70 percent of the way there and then i'll put it down for six months and then i'll pick it up and i'll get all excited and that usually takes me over the finish line okay so you put acting down for 12 years you know (laughs) (laughs) i didn't particularly want to do that but it was basically that was that was the that was really the best option that i had back Mm -hmm. then 2005 you know what i love when i look at you know when i look over your career and I see everything that you've done. I mean, you have done so. You're stage trained. Your stage, yes. your stage performances. I still want to know how fun it was to play Dracula. I have to know. Oh my god! Oh my god! Everybody should get a chance to play a monster. Uh, it's especially like, like a sexy monster. Oh, I, I, it was super fun. It was a super fun. You know, I look back at my my career and I I I sometimes marvel that I had the opportunity to play so many classic roles of you know the American and world theater. I, I mean, you you just uh, you played Algernon and the importance of being earnest. You know, favorite role ever, Algernon. Oh my God! What what made Algernon well, your favorite role? Um. 
feel a kind of a deep kinship with that character. Um, I think I think it was Oscar Wilde's response to Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream in that um, Algernon is the most Puck-like character I've run across since, well, Puck. Mm-hmm. The, the character sort of exists to sort of poke fingers at people to see what they do. And there's there's something kind of beautiful anarchy in it. And then you have uh, Oscar Wilde's gorgeous language, yes. where every line is a joke, depending on how much you know. Um, it's just, a, when that play works, and you can hear the audience just roaring with laughter at a play that's over 100 years old, there's something just incredibly satisfying about that. Well, you know, and I look at, you've done so much Shakespeare. Um, yeah. Something that I think everybody in elementary school or junior high school, when they got introduced to The Merchant of Venice, they swore, I, it's either you love Shakespeare or you hate Shakespeare. But I know thanks to, you know, Joss Whedon's interpretation, thanks to what mm. Fran Kranz and Chris Mott just did with A Midsummer's Night yep. Dream at L.A. Film Festival. That's right. If those, if you people had seen, if that was somebody's first experience with Shakespeare, you would love Shakespeare for life. I totally agree that the the context in which you experience Shakespeare matters extremely to your enjoyment. Uh, a high school production of Romeo and Juliet, no matter how charming it is, is not comparable to the Royal Shakespeare Company version, or you know, even Baz Luhrmann's version, for that yeah. matter. But, yeah, I look over a lot of the things, and I know you've done more than what's even on your resume. But yeah, I com- have. coming out of theater and now jumping into film with, and then there was Eve, is, is there any muscle memory in there as you go into film, or because it's a new medium, quote-unquote, um, is it like starting from scratch? Um, it's sort of like both, actually. Um, acting is acting is acting, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, At its core, it's basically, um, I forget who said it, you know, it's living truthfully under imaginary circumstances. In my world, I just think of it as an opportunity to be uh, five years old again in a sandbox where I could just imagine stuff. But muscle memory, yes, was super helpful in the the sense that I have 14 years of experience of replicating a moment. Right, because mm-hmm. you do a long run of a show, and you know you you have to replicate those moments that happen. But by the same token, muscle memory was a bad thing because now I wasn't playing to the back of the hall because the camera was a you know a, a foot away from me. So it was that sense of like how how much can I strip away of a, of a physicality because it's just not necessary. Mm-hmm. And so I actually made, in my notes about Eve as a character, I just said uh, she is still and moves only when she feels like she needs to move. Mm-hmm. As a way of kind of reminding myself that I didn't need to go big. No, your performance is very nuanced, very subtle, very quiet. And that Good, just, I'm glad. You know, and that just draws... That makes you, the character, that makes Eve even more interesting because we want to know what is making Eve tick. What, yes. the, with the quiet, you know, it's like when somebody is really, really, really mad at you and you expect them to blow up and then right. you don't get the huge outburst and then it's just a very quiet reproach and you just keep waiting for the other shoe to drop or what, okay, what's coming, what's coming. And very much with Eve, because you play her so close to the vest that... I think that's that's an intrinsic to the story, though, to some degree, because Tanya's character, Alyssa, I mean, she's having the very obvious sort of troubles. She's going through meltdown. And yeah, she's going through a meltdown. And Eve knows everything about why she's going through a meltdown. But she's been told and she's decided that she's not going to, you know, tell the truth and that she's going to play along in the hopes that Alyssa discovers for herself. And so that suggested to me an idea of, you know, there's Eve is, is performing on a level that she can't let Alyssa know things, mm-hmm. which, which lent itself to this idea of, 
he being a very good poker player, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Holding her cards close to her vest and not letting Alyssa's actions, not letting show the hurts that Alyssa was putting her through. Mm -hmm. Because that, that was, that would be counterproductive. So it was very interesting in that sense of, um, you know, discovering for myself and justifying for myself why Eve was going through all of this. And I always landed on because she loves her Mm -hmm. and she never stopped loving her. And I always have told people when they, they ask me what the film is about. And I say, personally, for me, it's about uh, second chances. It's about about love. Two people getting uh, the most unexpected form of a second chance ever uh, because there's genuine love there. Mm Mm-hmm. And that was just incredibly, the very first time I read the script, that leapt out on the page to me that these two people love each other so much, but there are these extraordinary circumstances in the way. And, uh, and you know, something I want to ask you, because earlier on the show, Amy Fox was on. Amy is one of the, she's the showrunner, producer, writer, and an actress in The Switch show out of, right, can, right. Th- th- that is transgender actors in transgender roles. Which I think which is, is awesome. Oh my God, we're finally seeing a shift. You know, when I came in the studio today and I was telling my sound engineer Pam, I said, "You know, this is amazing. You know, the disabled community has been up in arms for years about why are you not hire? Why do you have able-bodied actors playing disabled people when there are plenty of disabled actors out there that could could play a role?" Exactly. Same thing with the trans transgender community, and switch. I mean, have you seen the show? I haven't yet. Oh it, my god. It's on my list. You are going to roar. You are going to roar. It is hilarious. Yeah. But what is so great as I said as I told Amy, every one of her characters this will this will erase stigma for so many people because everything that that everyone is going through, it's something that everybody else is going through or has experienced. With bad dating, right? Getting fired from your job, not having any money, realizing, uh oh, I can't even afford rent. I got to go sleep on the couch of my ex. Um, okay. Mm-hmm. Granted, we we don't all have an eco terrorist living next door to us, like one of the characters <laughs> in the switch. But you know, there's a troubled teen who gets bullied at school. You know, and everybody, all all these characters are trans characters, but they're human. Everybody yes. is yeah. human, and I and think that's what people keep missing. I agree, and I think it's also kind of beautiful that that means that there's going to be a whole generation of younger trans people who see who see themselves on screen. Yeah, you know, like they don't see Jared Leto being one of them; they see themselves, and I think that's really important. Mm-hmm. How important? But how- also, no, go ahead. Wait, go go on, go on. No, no, I, I was going to ask you how important it was for you when Savannah came to you about, you know, and then there was Eve, that you were the one chosen to play Eve. I, I had known up, up until the point that I got cast, I had known that they had been looking uh, basically internationally for a trans woman to play Eve. Um, and... Once I got over the shock of being cast as a lead in an indie feature after 12 years of retirement, <laughs> which was its own kind of shock, um, I was thrilled that I was going to have this opportunity to, I don't know, help help establish something, right? Mm-hmm. To, to prove a point in a way that, um, you know, trans talent is out there. And if you're going to tell our stories, you'd be kind of foolish not to have us involved. Mm-hmm. Not just for the lived experience and, and basically the, you know, the writing of the story or things like that, but just from a sheer practical acting standpoint. This was a, a, a cisgender person playing a trans person. They have to do like two levels of acting, mm-hmm. right? There's what the character's doing, but then they also have to put on this kind of their version of an imagined world in which they are trans. Mm-hmm. And that's never going to approximate the actual experience of transition and having been through it and, you know, all of the tiny little moments that make up 
the history of having been trans. Mm -hmm. And I thought this is going to be amazing because I'm really just going to be able to make Eve this person and I don't have to worry about the trans thing at all. I don't even have to think about it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Oh, that makes perfect sense. And I think what it showed, and I, you know, and some of the reactions that I've heard from the film, is that that's one of the big takeaways that people are like, if they feel like they're seeing an authentic trans experience, no matter how heightened the circumstances of the story are, because they're just seeing this woman who happens to be trans, mm-hmm. right? And so her transness, while important to the story, by the time we meet Eve is not nearly as important to her. Right. She's just Eve. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like a cisgender actor would probably have to do extra work to not fall in the trap of playing, oh, I'm trans, too. Mm-hmm. Right? No, that uh, that makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. And that is undoubtedly why it looks so effortless and you know why I walked away and had no clue because you were so believable. <laughs> you're going to laugh at me. You're going to la- just me. You're going to laugh at me about that forever. I know this, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, to be very honest with you, part of my own sort of internal, I suppose, defense mechanism has always been that even though I'm, I'm pretty blessed in the gen- genetic department and I pass for the most part, I um, I always expect when I walk into a room that people are going to find out. And so I'm always surprised when people don't know. <laughs> I'm just always surprised. I'm like, really? I, 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 just, I was just entranced with your performance and thought, damn, <laughs> she's good. <laughs> oh, that's lovely to hear. <laughs> but do you find the tides are shifting? Have you been going out on any more auditions? I know you've been working. I don't know what you've been working on. But, uh, yeah. But I know you've been working. Are you finding the tides are shifting at all? I do. I do think they are. Um, I, I just finished shooting a horror movie, and I was just cast as one of the killers. <gasps> um, and she's, oh. just, she's, just, she's just named woman. There's nothing trans about her. Um, And that thrilled me to no end, because it was like being trans had nothing to do with getting cast. I just got it because you were good. the right scary version of of what they were looking for. The Dracula vibe was coming through. Oh, I I love that I I get to follow up Eve, who's very, you know, femme and prim and proper. With just this messy wreck of a woman covered in blood. It was kind of fun. Okay, now i got to ask you, one of your photos that you threw on your website of the bloody arms and hands, was that during the shoot? That is during the shoot, yes. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, now. I, I, but d- I, yes, <laughs> the, the whole casting experience, uh, the casting director, when I got it, she called me and she stressed. She said, Rachel, you got the role because you were right for it, not because you're trans. I don't even think they know you're trans. And, you know, that was pretty big. I still think that's pretty big. It doesn't mm-hmm. happen very often. Mm-hmm. You know, most of the time, trans people, if we're cast, we're cast as trans people. And while I think we should totally be the ones playing those kinds of roles, um, I do believe that, you know, we could just play other kinds of characters, too, for where... The transness doesn't matter, mm-hmm. right? The friend, the killer, the lawyer, the doctor, the scientist, the sidekick, hell, the hero, the villain. Like, there's no reason why we can't play those roles, too. Yeah, and that's always been my argument with film and television, with casting, no matter what. It should always be the best person for the role, the best person for the job, no matter who that person is. No matter. I almost completely agree with you. Almost, almost complete. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I mean, I've you know been sort of thrust into this argument uh, about casting in Hollywood, mm-hmm. um, and I do believe that if you're going to tell certain specific kinds of stories, the best person should come from a pool of people who intrinsically can relate to that character. Well, yes. So if you're making if you're making a film about 
blind people, you should cast blind people. But yes. within that, you should absolutely cast the best person. Mm-hmm. Yes. Does that make sense? That, yes, it does. It absolutely does. So that's how I mostly agree with you. <laughs> you know, and then it still gives you the option if you really can't find anybody who can act their way out of a paper bag for the part, then you can then you can delve a little deeper. <laughs> exactly. Or you can just shift gears and go, does this person even need to be trans? Right. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the case of Eve, they were so adamant about casting a trans woman for Eve that um, they were about to push production for the second time because they still hadn't found Eve. Oh, my God. Which I think is actually really commendable because, you know, that's money. It's very, yeah, and, and we both know how hard that is to come by when you're doing anything. Oh, my God, yeah. So that level of commitment that they showed to that it was it was that important to the story. Mm-hmm. And so they were like, we're just going to keep auditioning until we find the trans woman who can play Eve. And, and then, I've always, always thought, well, that was amazing. I mean, yeah, that was an artistic choice because it was so intrinsically part of the story. And instead of taking the easy route out, route out you know, they, they stuck to it. Mm-hmm. I think there's something very impressive and commendable about that. There very much is. Something else that's very impressive and commendable is your music. Oh, my God. A woman, I want music for a rabbit's nose and a winter fire. I want those as ringtones for my alarm on my phone. <laughs> they oh, are, that's lovely for you to say. They are fabulous. Um, in my job, where I, I used to work at uh, Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin, it was where my wife teaches gender studies, and I was in the communications department, and I helped reinvent a lot of practices there. I started their social media. I shepherded for five years their video series um, and did a bunch of photography. And in in the course of that, I started writing music for the videos that I was making Um, because it was like, well, I don't like that. I want I could write something. I could just write it. Um, And the two that you mentioned are two pieces that both come from, from videos from that era that actually work really nicely as standalone instrumentals, too. Oh, my God, yeah. I found them, you know, I found them on your site. And it's like, oh, I got to listen to these. And within just the first few bars, it's like, I need these for my alarm clock on my phone. <laughs> I, oh, I'll send you, I'll send you <laughs> MP3s of them. <laughs> I just thought, oh, my God. And your, how, your album, is your album coming out yet? You still- uh, in fact, I'm, I'm going back to Appleton, Wisconsin uh, in two weeks, and that's actually where I got my start. I have, um, there's an artist named Corey Chisel. He's a Grammy-nominated singer-songwriter, uh, comes from Americana, kind of that country rock tradition. Um, he is a local boy who made good and then came back to town, and there is a monastery on the outside of town next to the Fox River, that he and his partner bought and have turned into kind of an artist collective where musicians and artists can come in and become artists in residence and have, you know, their own space plus this giant chapel to record in. And that's where I got my start again, um, was I was made an artist in residence there at the beginning of 2016. And uh, that's really where a lot of my artistic leanings got awoken again. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, since I'm going back, I have decided to take four out of the eight demos that I've written for the album. And instead of doing them in the studio, which is what I've been doing, you know, very in the studio, mm-hmm. I'm going to get a small, I'm hoping to get a small all-star collective of musicians and do them as, as if they were a band, as opposed to uh, me playing everything. Oh, nice. And I'm really looking forward to doing that, because there won't be synthesizers, there won't be drum machines, there won't be the whole studio polish tricks that I probably rely on too much. It'll just be bass and drums and electric piano and guitar and voice. Wow. And so that's that's the plan. And once that's done, I'll release that as an EP. Mm-hmm. And then we'll see what happens. And, of course, then you've got your your photography book that you're working on. Yeah, the big laugh. Oh, my God. 
Yeah, I, I just think that's I, that's a hilarious uh, concept. Photo essay of yeah. the gut laugh. Yeah, I shot 76 people over two days. Um, and each one of them I was able to draw out some form of a big laugh. And what I was looking for was that, that laugh that's unconsciously, con- you know, that isn't consciously controlled where you're, you, that's the snort or where you make the sound that embarrasses you. But you can't help it because it's such a genuine emotion. Mm-hmm. Um, and they'll be printed as very large black and white photos. And in the gallery space, you know, you should be able to uh, put headphones on and listen to what was going on during each session. Oh, wow. So you'll be able to hear them laugh. I just, the initial idea came from this idea of a big white gallery with these giant black and white portraits, sort of like Richard Avedon stuff, Mm -hmm. except that they were all in the middle of that giant embarrassing laugh. And in shooting it and editing it, the real beauty about it is, is these are the kind of photos that under any other circumstances people would be like, oh my God, you're not showing anybody that. Look at my face. But because it's being driven by a genuine laugh, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden what under any other circumstances would either look awkward or grotesque or something is suffused with this kind of joy. And I know I've shown it to a number of people and I have great satisfaction that people look at the photos and they start laughing. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. It's a common thing. It's one thing that we as human beings, everybody got laughs. Yeah, and it's it's funny. I thought of your Big Laugh project yesterday when I heard the news about Jerry Lewis passing because he has always, uh, always been able to just make me erupt in gut laughter like there's no tomorrow. Right? And it, that there's something so beautiful about that kind of laughter. Mm-hmm. Like it's an adrenaline rush. It's you feel good after it, even if you laugh so hard that your stomach muscles hurt. And that you're crying and your mascara's all over your cheeks and, yeah. It, but you don't care. You don't care. No. It's like a runner's high, except you don't have to run. Thank God for that. Amen. I... <laughs> Not interested in running. No. Well, unfortunately, we are almost out of time. But before we go, I have to ask you... I know that, uh, and then there was Eve, is still on the festival circuit. Yes, we just opened the Women's Texas, Women's Texas Film Festival last week. And we have, we've gotten into another one, but I'm not allowed to say which one yet. I know, they, they're very strict on when things can be divulged. Yes, but it's still going. And, I'm, uh, you know, the audiences react in really kind of beautiful ways. I like the conversation. I like my favorite compliment that I've gotten about the film from people is, you know, I was still thinking about it the day after. Mm -hmm. And I was asking myself questions and how would I deal and what would I do? And that is just incredibly satisfying. So the fact that it's still out there on the circuit and that more and more people are going to get to see it and cross our fingers, we'll get distribution soon. um, I'm really looking forward for it to get out in the world and for people to see it. And I'm very proud of it. Do as well you should be, because it is. It's a wonderful, wonderful film, and your performance is just amazing. And I was so excited the minute I heard that you guys picked up the LA Muse Fiction Award at LAFF. I was just thrilled. Oh, I was thrilled for you. That was super, super amazing. I do sort of want for everybody who's in the performing arts. For just once to be in that crowd and to hear the name of your project get called. It's very magical. Yeah. Well, my friend, you will thank you so much. You will you will come back on the show. Of course. Oh good. Oh good. As soon as I have something to talk about, I will come back. Well, as busy as you are, I'm sure you're gonna have something to talk about. I definitely have some more stuff coming up, yeah. Oh good. Rachel, thank you so, so much. And everybody, check your festival circuits for And Then There Was Eve. And then we'll have a horror movie soon, too, I hope. (laughs) Yes, we will. Thank you, Rachel. Well, thank you so much. This was super fun. Oh, and I will talk to you soon. You got it. Be well, my friend. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. And that was Rachel Crowell. And Then There Was Eve. Be on the lookout for the big laugh. 
be on the lookout for her album that'll be coming out probably by the end of the year. Check out Rachel at rachelcrowell.net. Um, we'll have everything on the on the video of today's show for you uh, probably up next week. But in the meantime, that is all the time we have today. Thank you to Amy Fox. Thank you to Rachel Crowell. We've got some more incredible guests next week for you, uh, starting with Finn Taylor talking about his new film, Unleashed. Until then, I'm Debbie Elias. This is Behind the Lens.